Hello, everybody. My name is Roman Bauer, and I'm going to talk about high performance computing for simulations of complex biological systems. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for having me. Now, this is going to be an interdisciplinary talk about interdisciplinary research and the fundamental principle that we are addressing in this research is this interaction between genetic rules as governed by the gene expression and the physical interactions of cells. So this is what we are trying to computationally model. And this interaction is very complex because cells behave in certain ways, which is governed by their genetic code, but their behaviors uh, are, are determined by what they sense. So the mechanical interactions that they sense or extracellular chemicals that they sense and so on. And this is too complex for any human to, 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 to grasp. And that's why we need computers. And often these computer simulations require a lot of computational resources. So one computational approach to, to address this interaction is so-called agent-based modeling. And in agent-based modeling, what we do is we model each of the elements as autonomous agents. That's why it's called agent-based modeling. And these agents can interact with one another and they follow rules that are inherent to them. So there is not a global orchestrator that commands the agents based on some global information, but all the information that agents use in order to, to behave in, in certain ways or in the ways that they do is based on local information exchange only. So the information that they have access to is available physically near their location. And there are different ways of how to, to inform those computational models. And one instance or one example for, for obtaining data from, from um, biological systems, and in particular neural systems, is gene expression and RNA sequencing analysis. So what RNA sequencing analysis or RNA-seq analysis allows to do is it allows to measure the expression of, of an RNA, uh, which then allows to gain to, to which allows to, to, to gain some insights into what the cells are doing. And just to give an uh, example of how powerful this approach is, and, and we have published in 2019 a paper where we look at gene expression and RNA sequencing data from the human retina. So the retina is a neural tissue at the rear of the eye, and it is part of the brain or uh, the central nervous system. And so it is a very attractive system to look at because it is peripheral. Um, it, it's not like deep in, in inside the brain. And so it is possible to gain, to gain uh, access to it relatively easily. But also the retina is actually well co conserved across mammalian species, different mammalian species. Even non-mammalian species have often similar type of retinal structure. And so one um, aspect of, of uh, or one data modality that we can look at is the expression of genes. And uh, here we showed just by analysis, so we haven't done any modeling here in this example, is we have looked at uh, a PCA from, uh, so a principal component analysis from this data set. And what we can see here in red is a very nice trajectory where one can see a developmental progression that is quite consistent from, from early stages. So PCW stands for post-conceptional week. And you can see here the numbers increase consistently in this kind of bow-like fashion. And, and, and this shows that the, the, the expressed genes are consistently changing during the development of the retina. And in blue, you can actually see similar uh, a similar pattern from from an organoid. So these are uh, human de human derived um, uh, tissues uh, or or cells that were grown into tissues, and and also here you can see a, a nice change in 
in, in, in this expression that aligns well with the developmental stage. So you see the, here the numbers are increasing over time. And so this is a way to analyze this data, but as a computational model, we want to go beyond this. We want to create models that explain the data because then we can actually generate hypotheses and test different hypotheses and compare different hypotheses. So we want to go beyond analysis and we want to create explanatory computational models. And now I want to give you an example of where we have done that. And in this case, we have looked at so-called retinal mosaics. So retinal mosaics are systems of cells also in the retina. And these systems are regular. As you can see here in green, these are uh, retinal ganglion cells where one can see how those cells are arranged very regularly. So you usually the, the, the distance between the cells is, is, is quite regular. It's not random for sure. And, and so the question that we ask is how can such retinal mosaics develop in a biologically realistic manner? And this is what we have published actually uh, earlier this year. And so what we did is we created a, a computational model that has different stages. So we have uh, an early stage, stage zero, and then we, we model different cellular behaviors, which we here call cell fate behaviors. So cells can assume a certain fate, which then defines its state. And, and also we modeled cell death and cell migration. So CD stands for cell death and CM stands for cell migration. And these three factors are all we need in order to explain the biologically realistic emergence of those retinal mosaics in a self-organizing manner. That's an important part of this. So we want to create computational models that are self-organizing because if a system is self-organizing, it means that there is no global orchestrator that tells the cells what they should do, but they organize themselves, as the name says. And so what we did is we had different stages where we used these three different mechanisms, and we could show indeed, as you can see here, with the regularity index, which goes, uh, which grows consistently, with those different stages until it reaches approximately a regularity index of four, which is very regular. So it's highly non-random. Um, a regularity index of one would be, would, would be random, but, and, 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 and you can see that, uh, or, or close to one would be random. Of course, it doesn't need to be exactly one, but you can see here this increase of the regularity index across those different developmental stages. And also we have looked at different densities of those cells because actually the density in the retina is not homogeneous it's not the same everywhere on the retina different parts of the retina have different densities so we also looked at the impact of the cellular density on this regularity because it has an important impact and we could we, we could explain how such uh, retinal mosaics develop in a biologically realistic manner and um, as i said we have published this here i cannot go uh, very much into detail, but but what we showed is that we can we can simulate the emergence of those retinal mosaics and then compare the st various statistics of those mosaics with experimental data. Now, what I've shown you is a, is a rather simple system, and and if you want to simulate larger systems, such as for example entire regions of the brain, maybe even an entire brain or an entire organ, then we need other tools. And uh, uh, then we need to, to use highly performing um, approaches. And in order to address this, this, this challenge, we have created the Biodynamo Collaboration. So the Biodynamo Collaboration is a consortium, is, is made up of a consortium of, of international institutions. And, and we have created a software that allows to simulate uh, systems, biological systems, in a in a biologically realistic manner, but also what is a very important in a, in a highly performing manner. So what I showed you before is where it was a rather small system, but with Biodynamo we can actually also address much more complex systems and much larger systems. 
And uh, this is the paper that we have published on Biodynamo. And what is also important to note is that Biodynamo is an open source software. So it is made available for free. And you, if you're interested, please have a look at the website, www.biodynamo.org. We have the, the, we provide a source code. We provide uh, installation guides and tutorials as well as demos, because that's another important part of an open source software project is that people should be able to use it, of course. And so, and so uh, yeah, at the moment you need to have some expertise or some knowledge of C++ in order to make use of Biodynamo, but not, you don't need to be a specialist uh, by far, but you need to have some, you need to know the fundamental, fundamentals and basics. And, and so if you're interested, please have a look at this website. And also you can reach out to me if you have any questions. I will at the end of this talk show my email address. And, and, and so uh, this is, a, I think, a milestone in, 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 in on the path towards the modeling of large biologi biological systems, in particular neural systems, such as the retina, which is a neural system. And also what I should highlight is that Biodynamo is not only a research tool and a, and a consortium interest in research, but we also are involved in education and, and didactic endeavors. So a few years ago, we have, for example, organized a competition where almost uh, uh, 20,000 students all around the world have participated in. And uh, this is because we are interested in, of course, training people and, and uh, training the new generation of students in making use of agent-based modeling to address whatever biological question they have, and potentially even non-biological questions, because agent-based modeling can also be used to model, for instance, social systems. And uh, we have currently some work going also on along those lines. And, and actually in two weeks, uh, for instance, I'm involved in a, in a, in a summer school where we will teach biodynamo and give tutorials to use biodynamo to experimental biologists so here you see now uh, an example of such a simulation which is uh, more complex than what i showed you initially and uh, here we have thousands of neurons and each of the neurons has again uh, thousands of of, of cell elements. So you can here see those neurites. So the neurites comprise axons and dendrites later on, which then allow to make connections between neurons. And you can see here a very complex structure emerging from very simple rules. So the, the neurites grow out in, in relatively simple uh, processes. But uh, as you can see here, the morphologies become very complex. And so this is a, a nice visualization to showcase that that even with relatively simple rules one can generate extremely complex um, functional uh, structural um, systems that then also can, could have in, in in principle function associated with it now we ultimately would like to model large scale neural systems uh, such as for example brain networks where we have uh, networks between individual brain regions and one important aspect of re of of complex networks of the brain is that they usually have so called hubs so hubs are are nodes in such complex networks that have many more connections than what one would expect based on a regular network and and in the human brain we actually have such hubs. So we have brain regions that are very strongly connected to other brain regions. And, and we see that uh, a lot in, in various different brain networks, also, for example, in the macaque monkey brain network. And, and we can uh, get such information also non-invasively, for example, from so-called diffusion tensor imaging. Here you see a visualization from such a, uh, a brain where we have um, data obtained with diffusion tensor imaging, DTI. And the DTI allows us then to, to get an, an insight into fiber tracts. So where do neurons, neurons connect to and how do they connect to uh, across those different brain regions? And this is done by measuring the, the uh, diffusion of, of water molecules. So diffusion tensor imaging allows to measure 
the diffusion of water molecules. And ultimately, we can use this kind of information in order to infer, infer the location of fiber tracts and orientation of fiber tracts uh, in order then to obtain information about, for instance, where are the hubs of the human brain. So, so if you look at this a bit more mathematically, then if you have a random regular network, so not a complex network, then we would have a network distribution of uh, a degree distribution uh, as shown here in red. So here you can see this distribution, which is a, a Gaussian um, a Gaussian distribution. It's a normal distribution and there are no hubs here. While here in the blue distribution, we have a, a distribution that is much wider. And here on the right-hand side of the blue distribution, we would have nodes that are highly connected. So the K value, which is their degree, is very strongly, uh, is, is very high. And so this means that those nodes are very highly connected. And, and this is the, the question that we asked in this paper here, just published a few years ago in 2017. How can such brain networks develop uh, that have hubs? How can hubs develop in such uh, brain networks in a biologically realistic manner. So what we did is we looked at a very simple model, the so-called nonlinear growth model, we, where we essentially add new nodes to the growing network, not regularly, not linearly, but nonlinearly. So we add more and more nodes at each time step. So first, for instance, we add two nodes, then four nodes, then eight nodes, and so on. And and this is uh, quite different from other classical network growth models where one usually adds at each time step one node. So we, we, we investigated and we studied how uh, this nonlinear growth model could potentially explain the hub related features of the human, uh, of, 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 of brain networks, as well as other types of uh, networks. So we looked at four different types of networks. We looked at protein interaction networks. We looked at the brain network of the macaque monkey. We looked at the C. elegans neuronal network, and we looked at international flight con connections across uh, between airlines. Uh, so airline connections between international airports, and th so these are of obviously quite different networks, but they all share that physical space uh, is an important component of those networks. And then what they did is we compared our nonlinear growth model. Uh, we compared it with two other models, so the so-called preferential attachment model and the duplication divergence model. So these are two very well-established models, but they are not um, uh, nonlinearly growing. So at each time step, in those cases, one adds only one node during the growth of the network. And so this is the crucial difference. And also there are some issues uh, with regards to biological plausibility, especially for the preferential attachment model, because um, it actually requires non-local information exchange. As I told you at the very beginning, in agent-based modeling and other uh, biologically realistic modeling approaches, we can only have local information exchange. But in the preferential attachment model, we actually have non-local information exchange. And this is, of course, a big problem. And so we wanted to check whether our biologically plausible and realistic model could maybe explain some of the aspects of or, or features of those networks that have all hubs. So we know that all of those networks have hubs, except maybe the protein interaction network. There it is debatable what you exactly call a hub or not. Now, we then looked at the different features uh, and i will not go much into detail here about what this feature means uh, features mean but essentially they are features that that are related to to the hub hubness of of a complex network so so um they can they they involve to some extent whether the complex network has hubs or not and and then what we did is we compared our nonlinear growth model with with uh, the, the preferential attachment model and the duplication divergence model. And we checked how well can our model explain certain aspects of this 
these networks, of these four real world networks. And what we then found out is that actually uh, the, uh, the comparison depends on what kind of nonlinear growth we are looking at. So we came up with two different versions of the nonlinear growth model. The, the A stands for absolute and P stands for proportional. So these are two different versions of the nonlinear linear growth model. And depending on which version you're looking at, you can explain uh, two of the features. So the CV value or HRCC um, in this case, or you can explain the CV value and the maturational trajectory as in this case. But there is no other model that can explain all of those three at the same time. And so our model has certain advantages, but we're not saying it's the best model, of course, but we're say, sh saying that it is uh, a biologically realistic, realistic model that has explanatory power and it can uh, perform well in benchmarks with regards to real world networks. So this is also relevant actually with regards to biomedical uh, applications. So one interesting observation uh, that has been published a few years ago is that subjects that were born preterm have a slightly different brain network organization as compared to term born subjects. And you can see this here in, in blue, which would be for the preterm subjects, you can see here that the distribution of the rich club connectivity uh, we, on the y-axis, we have the rich club connectivity uh, or organization is higher for blue, so for preterm, as compared to red, which is term. And what we then did is we checked whether our model could potentially explain this difference. And indeed, again, we could reproduce this higher rich club index for, for preterm subjects as compared to control term brain networks. And this is, of course, simulated, but it, it has a certain explanatory power to a biomedically relevant topic. And they have published this a few years ago. If you're interested, please uh, feel free to look at this uh, publication, which is available as open access. And so I would like to highlight that the brain is, of, of course, very complex, and it, it, has, it is a very large system. It has uh, 86 billion neurons. And, and so this is a computationally challenging uh, system, uh, but ultimately we would like to use agent-based modeling in a performing manner, which we can do now with BiDynamo in order, in order to model this connectivity on a larger scale, on a global scale. And of course, there's quite a lot of work that we need to do, but uh, we are, I think, on a, on a very good path towards this aim. So I would like to conclude that agent-based modeling is a, is a powerful approach and it is multi-scale because it allows to incorporate aspects of on a cellular level as well as extracellular level. And, and also um, we have looked at various systems. I did not show now all the different systems we have looked at, but we have used agent-based modeling for a, a large number of different use cases. And uh, other approaches are computationally less demanding, but they're more abstract. And so what we would like to do in the future using BiDynamo is to upscale our models for, for large systems, ultimately even whole brain simulations. So I would like to thank my collaborators. I could not list, of course, all of them, uh, but I'm very grateful to, to the many collaborators um, ahead uh, in, 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 uh, on this path. I would like to thank my lab, the Combine Lab, and also the founders. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you.